I'm Bonnie Hayes, and welcome to Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department at Berklee College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. As usual, we are joined by Assistant Chair Cheryl Bailey. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, and this time I have my guitar department mug, which I was discussing with Bonnie, who covets one. I do Ooh. need one. And, you know, also, I see that you've you've uh, marked it because we're in the office today so that no yes. one else will take them. <laughs> yes, no one else better. You better know better than to touch That's them. The one thing I would I would steal that. Yeah. <laughs> Have if I happen to find mugs, it. <laughs> with maybe the one thing of getting 53 matching mugs is that. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, Ian Steed, our senior coordinator, is with us as usual. Hey, all. Good morning. Good to be here. And our guest today is the chair of songwriting, Bonnie Hayes. Woohoo. Hey, Bonnie. Hey, Kimmy. How are you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We're good. Thank you for hanging with us on Coffee Talk. I'm really um, happy to be here. All right. So, Bonnie, what do you have? What are you drinking? I'm actually drinking tea because I had my coffee uh, okay. really early this morning. I had one of those early wake ups today. So, mm -hmm. I had the coffee at about six. Nice. What, and so I had another what? cup at eight. <laughs> and that was it. So, I have to switch to tea. And um, what what do you do for coffee? Tell everybody what you're. What I have um, I've been through all the coffee permutations in my life, from the stovetop espresso to the plunger French press to all manner of percolators. I currently use a Nespresso um, Virtuo, and generally have a big massive cup and i do steam oat milk mm. only oatly barista because i'm a real snob and uh put a dab of uh half and half in there just for the cream factor nice yeah so i'm pretty detailed <laughs> yeah. not that surprising that you <laughs> <laughs> the job kind of requires it but also <laughs> goes with my personality also the art yeah exactly yeah, yeah. For, for real yeah so one of the things we always start with is um, first days, first, you know, first impressions of Berkeley, because a lot of the people who listen um, are are coming to Berkeley for the first time. So um, what's really cool about this one is that you and I started on the same day of Berkeley. Um, what do you remember about the early times? I mean, there's so much. First of all, it was big you know, um, and just that concentration of all of these really talented people in a, in a, you know, one school was kind of just great. It was amazing. It was like being in a town full of, you know, songwriters and musicians. Then there was the fact that the buildings were spread all over the place though, which was very like, wait, what is this? The number system, <laughs> um, 921. 301 I was like what is happening and then um <laughs> basically my office which was like it had like 12 file cabinets in it full of paper stuff and I had to call physical plant and have them remove it because I am not a paper person that's most that's my and then I remember meeting you and mm -hmm. Simone Pilon mm -hmm. and uh Dave Margolio and, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Marvelio. <laughs> yeah. I remember just standing by the coffee machine at that opening orientation yeah. with Dave, just looking around like, okay, the guitar player and the bass player here, like, what have we gotten into? You know? Yeah. It was, um, it was fun. The orientation really helped me. Um, do the students do an orientation like that where they, where they get put into sort of groups and hang out with each other? It was really nice having a cohort to come in with, you know. That was cool because I mean, when we first started hanging out, a lot of the topics were, "What is this place?" <laughs> no. You know where it's going. It's just a lot. There's a lot yeah. of like, kind of secret arcane knowledge, like the whole building thing and all of the acronyms. You know, the ALC and the, the WGD and the, the PED. Right now, it's just you know learning all of the secret knowledge. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I mean, not to reveal too many of our secrets, but um, we formed a secret club, Bonnie and I, not <laughs> secret, but um, of chairs, of new chairs. And then we would have special guests. So like people who had been for a long time, like Larry Bayonne would be a special guest and come and explain things to us at dinners, you know, like, okay, what's this? What's this? You know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It, it was a lot. Yeah. I liked it though. I mean, it was exciting. It is it still is exciting. Yeah, I think. Don't you? Yeah. You find it exciting? I... It's thrilling during scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm a uh, laugh a minute. I, I think it's one of those places where you honestly, no matter how long you've been here, you really don't know what's going to happen day to day that's I would, anything could uh, happen really anything could happen so i think and that's does cool. it does and does um, and yet there's that feeling of kind of being like there's a river of students going by right and we are like the rock in the in the river and there there's always a river but it's different people <laughs> so you can't step in the same water twice so i it's kind of weird like holding still while the students Mm -hmm. pass through and I'm friends with like 30 40 year olds who were students when I got here so you know what I mean it's yeah. it's like they're changing but I feel exactly the same well it's interesting that you say that because Cheryl and I just hired um Cecil Alexander to come and he was a student when we came and then um and then his wife was Ari really, yeah she was a songwriting major right yeah, I think I think she's going to come work for us this summer. See, that's the thing. That's part of it. And she was my student. She was a directed study student of mine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I love that. I love when you get to hire the people that you trained. You know, they're well trained then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many things that we can talk about, um, partially because guitar and songwriting are, are obvious collaborators at Berkeley, right? Yeah. Like so many of your students either have guitar as a primary or secondary instrument. Yeah. So that's a natural. Um, but there's also the the fact that you are a guitar player and you had a very a stretch. Long, but... I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. It's kind of like saying I'm a producer. I'm a songwriter, producer and guitar player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's functionality, there's demonstrable skill in there, right? It's so, true. It's yeah, true. it's true. Yeah. Um, but you had a very long and career as a songwriter before you came. So I think what you're bringing to this is, you know, our students want to go into this world where, you know, of course, things change over time. But you had this long career in the in the professional life that they would like to go into. Yeah, and your perspective as a teacher and as a chair come from your life experience. Yeah. Okay. And but interestingly, you know, I wasn't I mean, I was trained, I guess, as a musician by piano teachers. I, I did play piano mm -hmm. uh, coming up and I come from I came from songwriting from a, a player perspective. You know, I wanted to be a jazz piano player. Right. And then I moved to New York and and realized that a I was not good enough and never would be um uh, you know I gave up basically and b that I didn't want to be because mm -hmm. I saw Joanne Burkeen and Eddie Gomez playing a duo at the Surf Maid uh and they told me they made twenty dollars each and I was like oh <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah uh, that was when I started and then I got a rock a touring rock gig as a keyboard player. That was like my first, I didn't really like rock uh, at that point. And so oh, I tell got us my... about that. So how did you, what was that gig and how did you get it as a piano player who obviously could play um, because they, they wanted you, um, but you weren't into rock. So how did you manage all that? Well, I just needed a job and I didn't, I couldn't, I can't do like waitressing things. Um, and they're just, you know, it was a really weird time. It was the '70s in the in New York, which was a very, very uh, kind of dire financially. And New York was a hot mess in the '70s. You know, it was dirty and nasty and rat infested. And you know, I was living in a freaking loft upstairs from Max's Kansas City, the cockroach, you know, condo, 
you know, it was, it was unbelievable. Anyway, so I was, I was not making any money and I was having trouble, you know, um, financially. And I, I had, a I had, I got a phone call from a guy I had met, um, in California who had gotten a record deal and wanted me to go on tour. And he was connected and we were opening for, you know, Bob Seger, who's like one of the biggest rock acts of the time and also writes all his own songs. Right. And so that that tour and they put me I mean, I, I hired a roadie right to move my stuff. I was staying in hotel rooms. I got my own room. Dude, I was raised with in a family of seven kids like, you know, I was suddenly in a hotel room by myself, like nice hotel room and somebody else was moving my gear. I was good. I was like this. I get why people like rock and roll now. And then, you know, the court, it was easy, right? It was like easy music to play. It was, and you needed to know your, your keyboard. So I had good gear and I had to figure out all my, pa all my patches and my parts, but, and then I had to sing backgrounds. So yeah, so I went on tour um, and met like Muddy Waters. We opened for Muddy Waters in Chicago at the Marble, Mar Marble Ballroom. Yeah, you know, these great, I had these great experiences. That was my first real tour. And when I got back, I had talked to Bob Seeger a couple times about songwriting because he took us all out for these big dinners. And I was like, how is this dude affording these big dinners? And he's like, yeah, you know, you make money from songs. It's like having, songs are things, you, it's property. It's like a house. In fact, in Bob's case, it is like a house. It makes you money <laughs> when you're sleeping. So, you know, I was like, hmm, I want to try to make money while I'm sleeping. And I started trying to write songs. It was a lot harder than playing the piano, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so you kept up with this keyboard playing, like side woman part of your career for a long time. Can you talk about how that developed as you were developing your skills as a songwriter? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I basically, the, the, um, I was a, I, I started my own band and got a record deal and got signed. I, I released like my first single independently and it was a national college radio hit. So I was like, everybody's like, let's sign her, you know? So I got signed and I was, um, so I had some money and money from writing songs. So it was like the first time I made, I got a publishing deal. And I, um, I basically pl had this band and made records and played the keyboards only. Right. And, um, but basically like in so and then I went through this thing of like the band fell, you know, the usual crap, like, you know, you're it, it, it revamps, you know, like then your band falls apart, you have a new band, it's different, it sounds different, then you lose your record deal. And then, you know, so in the breaks in between, and then you're, then you're too old to be a recording artist, and you turn into a professional songwriter. And in the breaks in between there, or when things weren't happening for me, um, in my songwriting life or my producer life, I would take a tour, right? Because I still, once I had done that tour and they knew that I had that experience at that high level, Nick's band was, uh, his manager was Tony Dimitriades who manages, you know, managed like Bob Dylan and Tom Petty, right? And so we, you know, I was getting called um, because I had gotten into that circuit. I could just say students, you know, if you're players, once you get a higher level touring gig, you will keep be you'll be in this very small pool of people that we, they know can show up with the right gear, be on time, not be an idiot, you know, um, and play every single night like your like your life depends on it, and you know get to on the bus at at six o'clock in the morning and and not whine about it, um, and so I think that just those basic things of just, of course, being able to play, but then also not being terrible, you know, in terms of getting on the bus, right? right. I think was really powerful. Um, I learned that stuff really early and it really came in handy because I had a couple of big tours with um, Belinda Carlisle, who was a huge star in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And um, on like her biggest record that she ever had, I went on tour with her. And then with Billy Idol, I went on the world tour for Cradle of Love. So those were great tours. You got paid great money. Um, somebody else moves your gear. You just got to get there, you know, get to the gig and 
be looking good and play your music as hard as you can and then go home and don't say anything <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was a great palate cleanser for me in between my more trying careers, right? Like, yeah. But, so I have some questions about just the how you approach the the keyboard parts and things like that, because even when we were like hanging out, you know, we're like blowing off steam and we would play things, you have such a harmonically sophisticated approach to the piano. Thank like you. everything we do. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, it's true, right? Like, I mean, the way that you, you know, like we'd be talking and you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm sight reading this Bach piece or I'm, or, you know, you're playing these tunes and you're like, oh, this tune is like this tune because it has this progression and this bridge. And, um, and it's almost like you're, you're talking like a writer, even when you're playing. Like, oh, absolutely. Do you, yeah. Do you feel like even at that time when you were on tour, were you bringing that kind of approach to, to playing? I and think writing? I learned that stuff from those, the parts that I learned on the, for the touring stuff. So, you know, what would happen is I would just, and by the way, I did, I was in Springsteen's touring band with Patty C. Alpha for a minute. I'll tell you the story about that if you want to hear it. But, um, but I did like, well, it was funny because that's a great example. I learned all the parts and it was like, gliss up to a high E on the organ and hold it for eight bars and then gliss down. <laughs> I was like, oh, got it. <laughs> so a lot of the rock parts are like that, right? Where it's just like, don't do anything. It's just hold a note that makes it feel exciting, right? Mm -hmm. But I did, I mean, in all of those, I, it was mostly, it was more about the sounds. I'm sure this happens with guitar. It's like, you know, there's so many variations on guitar tones. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was also true of like synth patches and, and keyboard sounds, you know? Um, and so really kind of fine tuning the sounds um, and then figuring out the parts and, and, and playing them and memorizing them. Taught me a lot about writing parts, about f picking the right sound, why you would use a certain sound for a certain part. Um, being able to hear the, the, the um, you know, kind of the fine points of that. Um, and that that really did inform a lot of my subsequent like sort of parts playing. I mean, there really is, you know, for for guitar players who are going on tour, it's parts. You know, you might get to play a solo, but you got to play parts like you, you don't get to play whatever you want on a tour um, and only in jazz, you know, and then in jazz, it's about how you're hearing it that day and how you're feeling it. Right. But. I think, you know, one of the hardest things in the world is being a great player and then having to play parts, especially parts that are really simple and really having to bring that refinement. This comes up all the time. We we're just talking about this in a class. Like, what can you bring? Like, you know, I, I, that there's this kind of terrible myth out there where like, oh, you know, you're a rock player, you're lucky because everything's so simple. You only need to know like three chords or whatever. But in reality, everyone who plays those parts is bringing like a universe, like a lifetime, like thousands of hours of experience. And the way you hear that from where I'm sitting is how they play those parts. Oh yeah. And, and so also the tone and the sound and the What shape. sound? Yeah, what tone, yeah. what amp, what mic, what guitar, you know, what strings you're playing on. Mm -hmm. Um if you're capoing or tuning funny, and then it's like a drone. Okay, it's kind of like the glissing up to the high E on the organ. It sounds dumb, but you know, I I have a lot of trouble getting people to do that, right? Yeah. Um and and so I feel like with guitar, it's the simpler the, I mean, I've been listening to a lot like Holly Humberstone. Okay. So she's like this young indie uh, songwriter who has all guitar parts and they're beautiful sonically. And they're these kind of washes of delay and sort of droney things like a lot of like, like one, two, five, or, you know, like these sort of sussy, like open fifth type of things. Mm -hmm. And every single one of those things, somebody, like you can't play a triad over and over and over again, right? And you can't, it's, it's like it doesn't work. You got to take the third out. Otherwise the, the overtones start building up. So there's all these little secrets to parts writing mm -hmm. um, of sort of creating these, these different types of, of um, textures, right? Mm -hmm. That I think 
it's really easy to listen to rock and roll or, or a lot of the pop and indie and and even electronic and go that's just the same thing over and over again but and then playing it consistently seems to be a huge problem i hear a lot of people playing like just playing it different every time it's like that's actually not the the job here you know right because you have to practice for consistency because in a, in a live situation you can't rely on just patching it in and having right. to repeat like when i lived in austin um i used to just freelance for um a and r people record companies to go see bands to see if their live performance matched the record just to see could they actually pull it off live yeah well that's uh, real because yeah. i mean it's one thing to record it it's quite another thing to play it live yeah um, um, and and to be able to come like i said before show up with the right gear on time looking good with your attitude mm -hmm. checked right and then bring to every single second that you're playing all of your refinement right i mean my brother you know was in he was the guitar player in huey lewis in the news and they yeah. toured like monster touring for years and years and years right and he used to talk he said he got so sick of it and he said but he would be playing on stage and and he would he go and all i do is i listen to bill gibson the drummer and i just every single chord i hit i make sure i'm hitting right with bill gibson's snare or kick right and it was just this focus this high focus on this one relationship and he would then it would be the keyboard player you go i'm like feathering him with the keyboard player so he would find these ways of creating rhythmic and uh, you know, refinement, right, of, of, of the way that parts fit together. I think for guitar players, this is one of the most important things you can do is keep on coming back and going, can I make this better? Can I make this fit better? Can I make it act in the song better? You know, so. Right, because, you know, when you talk about those Huey Lewis tours, I remember when those pop hits were big. And I also remember Cradle of Love. Those, <laughs> like the tour that you were on, that energy that you have to bring when you're on the road and like you know no now knowing more of like from from being friends with you all who have done that how are you feeling every night like Dude, where tired. are you every night you know <laughs> what i mean and you got to get out there and you, you just have to bam you just have yeah. to do it that's a real skill well that's, that's the other thing that i think we, we we can't really teach people which is just you learn it from i mean i get up on stage and pardon me shit happens right like we're not i'm not going to get up there and phone anything in ever in my whole life right we do not phone things in um in my world as musicians and i think you know one of the things about young musicians is they'll they'll play a gig and they'll be like this is beneath me like this gig this gig is something that you know that i shouldn't be having to do or this this gig is stupid and then there will be this kind of shutdown they stop relating to the music and connecting to the music because they don't they, they feel like it'll be good if they just play it at the bare minimum and i think that's a real mistake you know people uh notice that and um, if I notice somebody doing it, that's it for them, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> they're not going to yeah. get hired and they're not coming to my house for dinner. So there you and, go. <laughs> and you do feel like, you know, the way you do anything is the way you do everything, right? I yes. Think that we've been trying to tell people that, like, the way you show up to class tells me how you would show up if I hired you for a gig. Absolutely. I mean, so it's this sort of ethic that I think great musicians all have or serious musicians have, mm -hmm. which is this is everything. Right? Mm -hmm. And every time that you do it, it's everything. And if you and and I think that's a real thing. I look for it in musicians, you mm -hmm. know, music. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is if a musician will play a free gig, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if it's it's like people, money, um, there's another people, money, music. You know, they'll, a lot of people will just go, all right, I'll play it free if it's got people and money or people and music or music and money, right? But so, you know what I mean? If you don't like the people, but the music is great and the money is great, mm -hmm. cool, you know? So that sort of thing of like, but I bring it no matter what it is. If I say I'll do something, I do it. If it's, 
if I go, God, I wish I hadn't taken this stupid gig, I still bring it, right? And I think that's the thing, learn to turn things down, you know, if, the, if you're not going to be able to bring it. But when you show up, you better bring it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's really interesting to hear you talk about this stuff because when I think about, I mean, you've written a ton of songs, but there, there are a few songs that I knew before I knew you that I really loved. And it's interesting to hear you talk about like tone, you know, in classical music, we always say like tone is a structural element, right? right? Which is true, which is so exciting to me that that's true in every style of music, right? Yes. And that also that you are a really good editor. Like you seemed like to be able to edit yourself down to like, what is the essence of this and what is the effect of it? Right. And um, so one of my favorite tune that you wrote, that's one of my favorite songs of all time is Love Letter that Bonnie Raitt, requ she recorded that tune, right? Yeah. Um, but what's so great about it, and I, I've gotten into conversations with like some of our colleagues about Love Letter, you know, our <laughs> guitar colleagues, like, you know, David Tronzo loves that tune too. And it's got good guitar parts. He was on that big tour as a music director for John Hyatt when Bonnie Raitt was like performing that tune, right? So, you know, and, and one of the things we're talking about is like, it's got great parts, but there's a simplicity in the construction of that tune that takes you to kind of unexpected places, but that are recognizable. And I don't know if you wrote all the parts for that or if you, but you wrote a tune that lent itself to certain parts that are simple, but they really build and they tell the story. And then you know that like, if this was played, which it was played in big festivals, that there's a certain part of that tune where people are just gonna go bananas. Yes. Like you can point to it. You're like- I made it. that happen. Because there's this like <laughs> little surprise. And so I always felt that way when I was listening to it, which I love because it's so funky and it starts out like really laid back and then it builds like, and you think like, how did that build? Because it doesn't build in this conventional way where like everybody's, it's just, it builds this tension. It's like you said, to it's a structural yeah. thing. So you have to build that into songs. I mean, the thing is the song is made to be played live, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and as far as the parts, like I have the the pleasure, you know, of, of having always worked with great, I'll have a, always have a, at least one great guitar player in my life who I go, come over to my house. I, I've been playing this thing on keyboards and I'll play it on keyboards. It doesn't sound cool at all. And I go, is there a way for you to play this that it sounds cool? And so, and they'll, and they'll be able to do it. Right. Or like I hear guitar parts, but I kind of had to cut extra stuff out of the parts more than actually writing the parts. It's more like they play too much. And then I just go, Hey, don't play that and that just play this. And they're like, okay. And then we record it. And once they record it, they just come back and play it the way it's on the recording, right. except for in the end where we vamp out and it's an organ solo mm -hmm. and the guitar player is freaking going crazy back there doing whatever he wants. So right. if you build in a space in a song where, where people get to go off, they will. <laughs> and, yeah. and that makes it so much more fun to play um, songs instead of having the parts stay the same all the way through. See, this is really cool because like, it always felt to me like a, a player wrote that song. It yeah. is because it doesn't yeah. have any fancy stuff in it. It doesn't yeah. have any, any, uh, I mean, it has a flat six chord, I guess, but that's like, yeah. I guess that's fancy. I mean, I remember everybody going, what's that chord? I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's a B flat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that was just because I was super, you know, I used the same, that same trick in Have a Heart. I was on the flat six right then. Yeah. I used it in like five songs. I mean, you yeah. know how you get onto something and then you kind of do it all the time and then you, mm -hmm. then you get over it. That was yeah. a but moment. There's a good example of two songs that you wrote on the same that were both hits that have right. a really different vibe basically written in the same week wow. <laughs> yeah interesting you know just how that stuff will happen mm -hmm. i had gotten a new keyboard so you know when i get a new keyboard this is the, the tone thing like mm -hmm. i will literally write a song so that i can use a certain patch right and I just was like really into this. I, it was a D50 and I was really into the sounds and they had splits. So they had a bass part and a, and a sort of guitar E kind of washy thing on the top. And I, that's when I wrote Love Letter. I just played the da -da, 
the flat seven and play the bass line, right? Yeah. And then it was so cool. I just loved it so much that I just mm -hmm. kept going. Bonnie, what is it like as a songwriter when you write a song that references your own life and then people are singing it? <laughs> I mean, you have to, the weird thing about it is you have to cut yourself i you have to just stop having it be about you i mean the weird thing about songs is they're they have to be about something that everybody can relate to yeah. um and it was about it was it really happened to me but dude i know that's happened to a lot of people <laughs> i would 100 tell you for sure uh that i know at least five people who have been in that situation so you know i i kind of didn't really, it's, it's not that personal. At a certain point, you know, I, I get the song done and I demo it up. I mean, I'll tell you what was personal. Bonnie Raitt came, I was gonna make a record and I didn't have, but I didn't have a record deal. And I was, but I was assembling songs for a record and I was gonna get, try to get a record deal, right? And um, so I had written Love Letter and Have a Heart mm -hmm. and a couple of other songs and they were on a demo that I sent to my publisher she heard the songs and she was signed. She had that deal with Capitol and she came to see me. I was like, nah, I don't want to give them up. I want to make a record. And she came to see me and was like, look, you need to let me have these songs. And I was like, oh, since you asked so nicely, <laughs> but you know what had happened was I had missed a share record by keeping a song for my personal record, my third record that I missed a 10 million seller. So I was like, I'm not missing another 10 million seller, which I'm glad I did because they bought me a house. So um, I would say, uh, take the door that opens. And then I had to let go of the song. I had to let go of my, my personalization of it and, and of it being emblematic of me. You know, I had to let it be emblematic of Bonnie Raitt. And um, I did that. You know, it's really interesting, like now that you're a chair, so much of what we do as chairs is like, you know, we're coming into this and there's this whole part when you come in, we're like, wow, you're the chair of songwriting. Like who's Bonnie Hayes, you know, and it becomes about you. And then like really quick, like within five minutes, it's the most not about you job <laughs> that ever was, you yeah. know what I mean? And, um, and yet you're coming to this, like you're running a department and you're trying to like, you're teaching students and advising students, but also shaping the department. And I feel like it's fair to say that you made a lot of changes when you came here. And it seems like a lot of them came out of just like, you know, from your experience, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. You know, like what are the mistakes people were likely to make? What should people know? Like, what do we have time for and what don't we have time for right you know? and um could you talk a little bit about that i mean i know that's a conversation in itself but what were some things where you felt like okay look you know you're a songwriter in the world well one of them is that i mean so there's this there's the artist songwriter and that's the person who's just writing to like express their feelings right there usually isn't even a thought of of who of of whether the song is other people are hearing what you're saying right it's just uh, this is this song is to express my feelings the problem with that is you cannot make a living mm -hmm. in 99 percent of cases doing whatever you want right and so with songwriting there's this craft element which is first like if you write songs that more pe that that don't bore the crap out of people um, you'll, you're more likely to be able to make money, right? I mean, it's just like being a player. It's, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't get to play whatever I want. I don't go on a gig and, you know, play the whole time. Like I'm soloing and show people how good I am. I don't, because nobody's going to pay me to do that. Right. And, and nobody's going to pay you to write songs that don't evoke feelings in strangers. Right. So paying making songs that strangers will pay money to hear is is what I think songwriters should learn how to do, right? And yeah, you can write song, you can write your pure artist songs, you can write your sad six, eight ballads as long as you want, but you need to be able to write, if somebody says, hey, we've got $60,000 for an up-tempo positive song with an empowerment theme, 
you better be able to write one of those. And you can bet your butt those kids that come in my office to take direct to study with me write several up-tempo positives, right? Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to make a demo for it because if you have to get somebody to make the demo for you, guess what? You're going to give up some of your publishing. Right. And that means like I owned all my publishing, uh, I own my whole writer's share and I made the demos and I didn't give anything up on Have a Heart and Love Letter and that's why I got the house. And so all I can say to you is, you know, we come into this from a pure, clean, uh, you know, I'm just doing this because I, I can't do anything else, but you go into the world to try to make money from it. And there's a bunch of other stuff that you are not, you know, that isn't fun, right? Unless you decide it is. And then when you decide it's fun to show up and be on time and look good and play the parts and play them like they matter and give a hundred percent and write a song that strangers are going to pay money to hear and get behind it and make a decent demo of it. When you decide that that's going to be fun, it will be. And then you can go have a career. And that was the stuff that I was like, well, let's teach them that instead of pie in the sky, you know, singer songwriter, right? Um, because I just don't think, I mean, it's a hard career. It was hard in the nineties. It was harder in the aughts. It was really hard in the teens, and now it's even harder. We just had a pandemic. No clubs are open. You cannot make a living touring right now. And so, you know, I'm just looking at it going, we need to teach them how to sit in their house and make money, right? And so I, I just feel like, I, so the, the specifics I won't get into, but I did, we did a much heavier business focus. We did a, a departure portfolio that's like a calling card. We created all these partnerships with the Career Center and other alliances that allow them to access industry and create relationships with industry. Um, we do offer support for the singer songwriters like performance careers and how, how you can do that. So we just kind of made it a lot more practical, I think, than it had been. Yeah, I think everything you're saying is it's applicable to any job you do. I, mean, I know you agree with me job. on this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we're going to go advocate for what we need, and then there's just going to be stuff that, like, we have to make it relevant. We have to you make it's it just fun. like with playing the parts every night. You decide yeah. to find a way to make it meaningful. And, you know, we, this is the thing. Music is meaningful. No matter how messed up you think it is that you don't get to do what you want, it's always, it always matters, right? And that's my driving you know intention right 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 um cheryl i'm watching you take notes and listen to all this so i i'm gonna hand it over to you well i'm now inspired to call my next collection of songs making music for strangers <laughs> i'll give you a point on it bonnie you go <laughs> no point necessary man <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things that are just so great and so honest and true um, about what you're saying. And I remember uh, I when I met you, I went to your page, at, you know, on Berkeley to read your bio. But your opening statement, I to me, still is my favorite of anyone's bio in that you talk about how you were into the Sex Pistols and, you know, punk rock, but you were love miles davis and to me that just it's so evident in your work and and these things that you're sharing with us about that you need to be you need to know about music you can't be you know i you run into folks out i'm a s s songwriter but i just want to be a natural right I, oh, I'm, well, I'm john lennon, yeah i didn't john lennon didn't know about music theory i'm like well you're gonna put all your eggs in that basket that you're the next john lennon without because you don't are not interested or taking the time or you don't really know how important it is to really know your instrument any instrument whatever it is guitar keyboards or your horn player and then know about music because you're gonna grab all those things you need that depth to be able to write music. Even to be able to play. I mean, learning how to improvise. So like, I mean, I think jazz is so important, you know, because it's about improvising. It's about showing up with the tools to be able to speak 
over a structure to determine the structure, especially, you know, a lot of times no charts, right? You know, you just best figure it out. And, and I got thrown in a lot of, I don't know if I ever told you, Kim, but I, for when I was first learning to play, I was, I was still maybe in high school or right out of high school. And Chuck Scherer, who wrote the real book, you know, he's a bass player, right? And I used to go play with him and uh, this guy, Ray Scott, who was a good jazz guitar player. And they would make me play, the, you know, um, in a different key from the chart, right? Like, and, and take a solo on take the a train right at 180 bpm you know whatever and they just spanked me right i mean and it was i remember just feeling so stupid and ashamed you know but i do feel like that prepared me for so much of this even the rock stuff you know just that ability to sort of be able to hear a structure and hear the 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 the, the default you know what kind of alterations or tensions were on the chords and how to, that would inform my choice of notes and you know, the tempo determining what subdivision I was able to use, all of that stuff really came into play uh, later on in playing in other. So I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm so grateful that I had teachers who asked a lot of me, you know, um, and uh, I, I mean, one of my first teachers taught me how to play the Berkeley piano voicings like you know um that maroon five song like their first hit um na -na 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 -na. and there's that piano thing it's like a, a a minor nine two minor nine five thirteen and then one major nine right and that i had to play those in in every single key moving you know in half steps moving up in half steps moving down in half steps moving up in whole steps moving up in minor thirds moving down in minor thirds and just like being forced to sort of have to have all of that, that stuff. I mean, I don't use major nines in my, in my teaching that much, but it informed, I can hear them, you know, I can hear a major nine like that. Also, I played you know, seven trillion of them. <laughs> the other thing about that too, cause I, I teach a harmony class uh, for improv, but and there's students there that are really already into that music and jazz, but there are a lot of other folks in there. And, you know, they might ask, well, why do I need to know about this? But really the American songbook is the template for song form. You know, if you study Cole Porter and you can understand that, even if you don't become a great soloist on that, or just learning those melodies and those chord structures and song form, it's the the eight, 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 yeah the a a b a form with the with the middle eight and and the way that i mean really once you play like i played a ton of standards gigs when i was coming up and i learned i mean i just know them i know the bridges i know a lot of the words because a lot of times they'd be like i had to sing <laughs> the standards what can we do it in a different key but you know honestly like i have to say I think for me, like one of the things is that thing about like a major nine, right? So nobody wants, you know, like we don't play stacked thirds as major nines in pop, but there's major nines everywhere, right? You play it on the four chord, right? It's a major third, it's a one in the three in the in the to in the key. You play the on the four chord, you know, you've got a, a major triad in the in the one. You play it on the four and it's a major nine without a third. And I think I hear that stuff happening all the time in pop music. So it's funny because we we don't want, you know, everybody's like tensions are not are not it, right? That, you know, it's just really simple chord progressions, but that's not the case. I hear major nines and thirteens and crazy tensions all the time in, in pop music being expressed in ways that aren't standard voicings, you know. So I think it's it's really important to be able and I it drives me crazy. Um, when kids can't even identify a, a chord type, you know, um, I think it's, it's, you know, really, really important to be able to, to have a beautiful sound and go, oh, that's that, you know. Um, so it's one of the great things about Berkeley, the four semesters of ear training. I wish some, I wish it would stick better, but that's another, that's another coffee talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's so worth it to just to remind everyone that these aren't just exercises that you go through for the sake of it. These are like professional development it happens in the classroom. Yeah. You know, you working on your ears and working on your skills. Um, 
That's what's great about Berkeley. I mean, we're really, you know, we are turning it. I don't know. I know that it's probably true for you guys, but I know the songwriters are going out there and killing it because they have hard skills, right? And so you get in a session, if, if, you, if there's already a lyricist in there, you write the melody. If there's already a melodicist in there, you write the chord progression, you know, you play the keyboard part. I mean, the great thing about Berkeley is it really does train you for almost any inevitability, you know? And I think that's so important, especially now. There's just so much competition, you know? Yeah, I think that's right. And you've had some good luck with Berkeley guitar players. Yeah. yeah, actually. Well, my favorite guitar player that I use back home um, is uh, went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Sean that's, Allen. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Hey, Ian, um, I'm throwing it over to you. Yeah, okay. Bonnie, I'm going to throw something at you, actually. Uh, a question that we ask everybody on this podcast. Um, which is what is something that students should be thinking about or a question that they should be asking that they might not think to ask well, or that might not be on one. their radar? I mean, you know, honestly, I'm so practical. And I think, I think it is important for students to uh, continually reassess the importance of music in their lives because, and, and that can come down to just how are you planning to use this in your life, right? And, you know, if it's okay if playing music is a hobby for you and you decide that you'd, you know, you'd rather have a job, it's okay. But having a sense of where it fits in your life um, is a really good idea. Unfortunately, it's hard to do that when you're, when you're 21. I think it happens, you know, later. I mean, I think students should be focusing on developing, getting skills, doing things that are hard. They are, they're, all, they're all like, well, that's not really what I do. You know, I go, you have to produce a track for yourself. And I'm like, well, I don't, I'm, it's not really my fort. And I'm like, yeah, that's, this is called school. And this is where we learn things that we don't already know, right? Like, you, you know, did you pay all that money to come here and remind me that you already know something? Like, I want you to do something hard. Can you, will you? And, and I think that's really what I would say to students is do the hard stuff, do the stuff that doesn't, doesn't fit your idea of who you are. You will be shocked at what a difference it makes later. Yeah, that's right. I think that's yeah. really, cool. you know, that's kind of the best yeah. thing I can say, I think, because they can they, they, a lot of the songwriters are like, I, I just write, I only write sad songs or whatever their thing is you know i'm like you won't for long <laughs> you can either learn how to do it here or out there mm -hmm. your call <laughs> yeah. i mean that kind of ties into a lot of the things that we talk about about just like i mean a lot of what we talk about on the, this is really fascinating because you know the literal things that we're talking about on this podcast are so different from a lot of the things we generally talk about which is generally like nuts and bolts of like guitar pedagogy right. or practice but i mean it ties so well into it that like you practice things that you don't think you need and then all of a sudden they're popping up everywhere or you're playing something else better than you would before right? oh absolutely yeah it it seeps into the other areas i mean and stopping practicing, which a lot of people do when they leave, is a real mistake um, because you kind of lose touch with your with your hands, you know. Um, so and with your, it stops connecting to your heart in your head, right? It, like those those connections need to stay alive. But um, I think it's really important to seek challenges. So Bonnie, can you talk about that for a minute about how you've continued um, to do that? Because I think what you just said is something that comes up a lot. Like it's another myth that gets dispelled that, you know, you, we really are learning throughout the course of your life and developing all kinds of different skill sets and approaches and, and that it pushes your music further. It's not like you, okay, I've got it down now and I'm just going to execute and then take a bunch of breaks. Like how have you kept well, I mean, for me, it was a little bit, so as a player, I, I, I topped out, but that's partly because I didn't keep practicing, right? Like I didn't keep doing technique and, and playing like more and more, you know, finding 
cooler and cooler chord voicings to tuck into songs. I basically got interested in whole other things. Like I started as a player, then I became a songwriter. I was a performer for years. And so, you know, a singer, a person who developed performance skills and the ability to get up on stage, like I said, and make, make things happen, right? And um, really deliver a show. And then I became a producer and I learned, I mean, I basically became a producer for other people and learned how to make tracks that you know, they wanted, right? Um, made records with people, you know, learned how to direct groups, learned how to use Pro Tools, learned how to, you know, master, right? And so I, I would move through kind of the next sort of thing that I was interested in. And but because I stopped playing piano in a, in a sort of, um, you know, there's a, there's a routine. You need to have a routine, right, as a player. And, you, and your routine needs to be, basically, you just, it needs to be really consistent. You can go, okay, this year I'm going to work on harmonic minor scales, right, or whatever it is. But that has to be, you have to have a routine. And um, I let go of my routine in order to do other stuff, right? Um, and that means I'm not the player that I could have been. So one of the things I would say is there's just, there's a lot of options out there. And you have, do have to follow your your interests, right, I think. But so for people who are, you know, real players, right? I think don't stop playing. Don't think that you've got it. You 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 have to keep that connection alive. Cause I know that I lost a lot of it from not playing. Right. You know what I love about when you say that too, though, is that sometimes people have this hierarchy of of what they think they should be doing or who what makes them who they are. And then when their life changes and they're they're not doing the original things instead of embracing it and saying like, okay, well, this is what I do now. This is what I used to do. They have this kind of like self-deception, you know, right. and like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm still a player. I, you know, no, no, I, 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 that's who I am. And then they just feel bad about themselves because they know they're not right putting in that time. And, and I, I think there, there are really different phases in, in a musical life. And I think yeah. it's important for people to know that and just be okay with it. Learn to be okay with yourself in it or make different choices. Yep. Um, I, I agree. That's something that you've definitely done. Yeah, I had like really a bunch of distinct phases and, and mostly directed by my own interests, but also by doors closing. You know, you take a door and other doors close. Every time that you make a decision, you lose a bunch of decisions. And I think that's one of the hardest things about this is you can't be great at everything. I wish I could, you know. But I can basically, you know, I chose a, a path of having an obsession and being obsessed <laughs> and making that somehow turn into a job of some kind. And that happened to me basically five times, which I feel very lucky, you know, because I went from writing, you know, playing to being a performing songwriter, to being a professional songwriter, to being a producer, to being a chair of a songwriting department and helping people learn. That's like five distinct phases that I think were all really important for the following phases, you know? And I wouldn't discount any of them. And I'm sure, you know, you, you have, I'm sure all of you guys have the same story to share, you know? But Kim, you kind of really stay up to, you stay up to speed on your playing. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, <laughs> but I think my, um, so here's an interesting thing. So I'm a classical guitarist and then we've hired a really great classical guitarist who I know, you know, we hired Berta Rojas to teach here. Yeah. And Berta, like being around Berta reminds me of like what it takes to play, like to have a concert career at her level. You know right. what I mean? Like, because, and she's just practicing way more than I do. Yeah, yeah. You know, and focusing on repertoire way more than I'm able yeah, yeah. to. And in some ways it's really helped me accept like, okay, I want to be the chair of the guitar department and I want to invest in that. And I also love teaching and I love writing this curriculum and I love, I'm learning about improvisation and I, I love the music that I'm writing now and I love the stuff that I'm doing and it's really helped me to like focus my practice on that right and not feel the responsibility to like bring all of to, western to keep music. being the old Kim 
Yeah, you know? like, and I <laughs> loved that phase where I played like a ton of different people's music, and I and I loved the phase where I played a lot of Bach and a lot of arrangements of things and in the standard repertoire. But, um, you know, it reminds me of this one story where you, we used to have these giant guitar cases, like, like they were made by Mark Leaf. This was like way back before there were like super light travel cases that you yeah. could get that are like eight pounds. This was like. I mean, you could live in it. It was it's right. huge. It was like this giant fiberglass egg. And I remember and I'm this. small. I'm small. You know, I mean, it, it would never destruct, though. Like, you know, you could a plane could run over it and it would be OK, you know. Um, but like, I just remember one day I was at a festival and I hadn't switched it out to a lighter case because I was, you know, that kid was like, no, 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 it has to be in the real case all the time. And I was walking up this hill like to the con to the church where you played the concert and someone was like like look look the classical guitarist you're like you're always dragging all of western music with you everywhere you go <laughs> you know <laughs> and i thought you know that's probably true like you know like who am i if i'm not doing that and yeah. the last several years of this job has made me really come to terms because if i didn't make choices about what i loved to practice and love to do it would be too hard to do all of it and I wouldn't do any of it. Right. And so, um, or you do it all poorly, you know? Yeah. And not, <laughs> and then you feel bad. Right. And I, I have to feel curious about things and I have to feel like I'm, you know, like what I'm doing is musically has integrity. And, um, and so I've just found a way to do it and, and come to terms with that because I'm doing this, there's not room for everything else and, yeah. and you know try to be okay with that um yeah and and you know some people were would say like well it must be weird to be like you know there's like five classical guitarists of different types on our faculty i i don't know how you feel about this cheryl but to me it actually makes me feel more comfortable like oh well yeah well berta does that or abby does that or freddie does that or david does that like i don't have to do everything because someone else does it and I can just be me, which is also great, you know, and that's one of the great benefits I think of having our job as chairs is that like, if you can be make delegating, peace. trusting, yeah. hiring great people, mm -hmm. letting them be great, giving them a space to make that greatness happen with students like that to me. I mean, it's kind of like band leading, you know, it reminds me of that a little bit where you hire. I remember for a long time, I used to tell everybody, I want you to play exactly these notes. Like I would make them play the exact part that I wrote. And then I started just hiring great guitar players and going, what do you hear? <laughs> and that was when I started, you know, like letting go of the total control and started to like trust other people to bring their greatness. Right. And I think that's where, you know, that's a leadership thing. Um, and it's a thing that, that now I do with faculty, you know, um, and so, I mean, that I'd say was my, would be my main contribution is the faculty who I hired. Um, who, we've just had some amazing people. You guys have a great, great team of teachers over there at guitar. Yeah. And I know it's been a, a real um, focus of yours. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's funny because our job here from where we sit, like with the faculty and in the departments, it, in some ways you have this illusion that you're sort of um, like in charge of it. Yeah. And in, in reality, I think it's like, um, it just reinforces more and more that you can't do everything because you right. have, to, you have to watch everything. So now it's like, you know, like focus down. Yeah. Or don't at your own peril. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe that's, that's kind of like the end, you know, like moving forward and some of these things that you're talking Just about. trusting people is one of the hardest things, mm -hmm. you know, for, for all of us to do. And I think, you know, but the, the, what's so great about Berkeley is that acknowledgement of all of the different ways you can be good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think we really do trust our faculty. I mean, I, I think that's I think true. you do. I really like the culture that you have created <laughs> over there. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. They're great. I mean, you can trust them in, in all the ways that you need to. You can give them the keys and just say, go be yourself. Be and a badass. <laughs> Kill well, me. You are, you know, like, that's why we picked you. Yeah, and, we hired you. <laughs> I think if you're in that environment where that's the culture of how people get hired, 
then it's even easier to sit back and feel like you can just be who you are at that moment because everybody's in that mode. You know, there's like this kind of baseline of trust. And so even if you don't believe it on that day, somebody thinks you're great. Yeah. You know, so I think that helps. How, so you have a, how many students do you have in the guitar department now? Is it's hard it a, to know, like Ian kind of knows, but we're somewhere around in the 900 ballpark now. That's what I thought. We sometimes hit the 1,000 or the 1,100 ballpark, and sometimes we're lower than 900, but I think we're around 900 now. It's a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of guitar players. It's a lot of personalities. So it does mean that, you know, you do want there to be like a, a, a flow, and it has to have, like, also the students need to know that they – I, we try to get them in a position of ownership, just like the faculty, like this place belongs to you. Now that you're here, you're a lifelong Berkeley guitarist. So let like, I love that whole element of it, that it's like, there's a Ber there's guitarists and then there's Berkeley guitarists. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it's really wild because Cheryl and I are working on this concert. We're honoring Mick. Good. Right. Right? And, uh, and, you know, as we're putting together the program, it's all these folks that Mick picked that are now teachers that are were his students and and they all have like, you know, you gotta sift through all their titles. Like, well, they're an alum and then they're a former faculty and then they're an honorary doctorate and then they're you know, and it's like it it's a Berkeley guitar sort of it's global. And it it's like, you know, there's people who graduated in the seventies and people who you know, here who will graduate next summer and then they're all kind of in this. And maybe that's good because, you know, if everybody can go out and say like, really learn your instrument as deeply as you can and, and know that's going to be your life and be a professional in all the ways that you've described and understand that you're going to have a bunch of different avenues in your career and the whole idea of all of that, all of that learning and all the relationships is so that you you can learn how to be yourself in all the situations. That's your not best bad self. to have thousands of those people out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like if, you know, I mean, in that way, that's how I think when people talk about, oh, you're going to change the culture of music. Well, you influence it by putting people out there who are healthy. Yeah. Well, and who can, it's and that same thing. Play. Are you going to show up, be on time? you know, look the part and play like your life depends on it every single time. And that's, I think that's the culture, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing. I will say because there's so many like kind of guitar players who don't really have technique or who can only play a certain kind of like in a certain box, you know, like there's those, you know, it, it, you'll hit their, their limit right in a session right mm -hmm. and um i think one of the things i love is finding a guitar player that uh, you know i can work with where i can ask them to do something and they they can do it even if they've never done it before because they have that technique and i would say that's what the berkeley guitar department mm -hmm. does to guitar players <laughs> because i mean i played a lot with a lot of guitar players who weren't educated at berkeley and where you do kind of you just run into what they can't do right mm -hmm. what they can't hear what they can't execute um and so you know it's it's a really complicated difficult instrument to play well so good on you you guys are doing a great <laughs> job because <laughs> it's one of the it's one of the most abused instruments do you know what i mean like nobody goes out there and goes oh i'm a i'm an oboist <laughs> you know and, and then grabs an oboe at the store and goes around <laughs> trying you know nobody does that right it's it gets you know I think it's easy to, to say you're a guitar. That's why I said at the beginning, I don't know, because I mean, it's hard to be a good guitar player. It's mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who are good at one thing and then everybody says they're good. And I'm like, that guy's not good. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, you can tell, right? And so I, I do think that Berkeley in that way distinguishes their, their, uh, their instrumentalists. Oh, that's good to hear. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It bodes well. Um, <laughs> so Cheryl, as we're kind of coming around to the end of our coffee, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Well, thanks for coming on and sharing the truth. <laughs> the truth yeah. according to Bonnie Hayes. Well, no, I, it, the truth is the truth and you've experienced it and lived it and you are teaching it and sharing it. So I know 
there are a lot, this one I'm gonna recommend to so many students, um, whether they're songwriters or not, just, you know, the whole, you know, how you uh, lay down the rules of the professional world, you know, as a player or a writer or producer, or whatever, these things that you need to have together. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And um, it, I had some good laughs too. <laughs> It's almost like a philosophy class. <laughs> so. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's what we're going to do anyway if we have coffee, so we might as well share that's it. That's true. Right? Once I get going on the coffee. <laughs> you're, you're, you guys are lucky I didn't have another coffee before this, or it would have been Woo! a <laughs> <laughs> Ian, what about you? What's your, what's your final thought? Yeah, it was a blast having you here and, you know, hearing your perspective. Uh, you know, it's so it was really cool hearing, you know, what, what's maybe different or like, you know, some fresher ideas coming from another department, some topics that we don't really uh, hear a whole lot of on this podcast, but at the same time, it's like even better hearing all the stuff that's so parallel and so the same and just about the work ethic and what it takes to be good, you know, at whatever you're doing, you know, whatever kind of music you're playing or if you're writing songs. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Cool. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you for fun. having me. It was fun. <laughs> so thank you, Cheryl Bailey. Thanks, Ian, Steed, and thank you, Bonnie Hayes. And um, thank you, Kim Furlag. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, we'll be with you all on the next Coffee Talk. Awesome.